Welcome to Coding Math. My name is Keith Peters, and this is episode 3, More Trigonometry. In the last video, Intro to Trigonometry, I went over the basics of trigonometry, described the three main trig functions, and coded up a sine wave. In this video, I want to go over cosine and tangent a bit more, and then look at some real-life examples where you'd use some of these functions. First, let's look at cosine. You remember from the last video that we looked at various values of sine as we went around a circle from 0 to 360 degrees. We'll do the same for cosine. Remember that cosine is the adjacent side of the triangle divided by the hypotenuse. Now, at 0 degrees, the adjacent side is exactly the same as the hypotenuse, as we saw when we were looking at sine. So we can say that the cosine of 0 degrees is 1. Then if we move to 30 degrees, we'll find that the cosine is 0 0.866, and at 60 degrees it's 0 0.5, exactly complementary to sine. Then, when you get to 90 degrees, the adjacent side is shrunk to 0, so the cosine of 90 degrees is 0. Now between 90 and 270 degrees, we're over here in the negative x portion of the plane. So the adjacent side, being on the x-axis, will be negative. So we'll get cosine values that go minus 0.5, minus 0.866, minus 1, and back through those to 0 again. After that, we're in the positive part of the x-axis again. So we go through plus 0 0.5, 0 0.866, and back to 1. Now, to refresh your memory on the sine wave, it looked like this. Again, the cosine wave starts at 1, goes through 0 at 90 degrees, down to minus 1 at 180 degrees, back through 0 at 270, and then back to 1 at 360 degrees. So you see, a cosine wave actually has the same shape as a sine wave, but it's shifted over. We say it's out of phase with the sine wave by 90 degrees. It's also worth mentioning that all of these waves will continue infinitely in either direction as you go past 360 degrees or into negative numbers below zero. Finally, let's look at tangent. Again, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So at zero degrees, the opposite side is zero. So the tangent of zero is zero. Let's use 45 degrees this time. At 45 degrees, the opposite and adjacent sides are equal length. So the tangent of 45 degrees is 1. Now as we get very close to 90 degrees, the adjacent side shrinks down to very small amounts, while the opposite side approaches 1. So the tangent gets higher and higher as the angle approaches 90 degrees. The tangent approaches infinity. At exactly 90 degrees, you wind up with the opposite side being 1 and the adjacent 0. But 1 divided by 0 is undefined, so the tangent of 90 degrees is undefined. At just past 90 degrees, the adjacent side is a very small negative number, so the tangent winds up being a negative number, approaching negative infinity as you get closer to 90 degrees. Here, at 135, we have opposite at plus 1 and the adjacent at minus 1. So the tangent is minus 1. And at 180 degrees, we're back to 0. At 225, opposite and adjacent are both minus 1. So the tangent winds up being minus 1 divided by minus 1, which is 1. Then we go through an infinity, undefined, and negative infinity cycle again at 270 degrees, just like at 90 degrees. And finally, at 315, the opposite side is minus 1, and the adjacent is positive 1. So we have minus 1 again, and then back to 0 at 360. Let's see what the tangent wave looks like when it's graphed. We start at 0, go to 1 here at 45 degrees, approach infinity just before 90, then come back in from negative infinity right after 90, back through minus 1 to 0 at 180 degrees, then repeat the cycle through 270, coming back to 0 at 360. Okay, 
So from a programming viewpoint, dealing with plus and minus infinity and potentially undefined values is not generally all that useful. So not surprisingly, tangent by itself doesn't get used nearly as much as sine and cosine. However, in a future video, I'll show you a very useful application of a related function, arctangent. Okay, now let's write some code. I have Sublime Text open with an HTML document. This is essentially the same as the document we used in episode 2, but referencing a different JavaScript file, Trigo2.js. If you have any questions about this setup, check out the first video in the series. That first video will also explain how this JavaScript file is set up and why. Now the plan here is to animate an object based on the values we get from the sign function. This is useful for all types of animations and effects, as you'll soon see. The first use of this will be to make an object move up and down or back and forth smoothly. There are three values we'll need for this. First, we'll need to know the center position around which the object will move. We'll call this center y. I'll also throw in a center x variable just to know where to place the object on the x-axis. These will be set to height times 0.5 and width times 0.5 to center the object on the canvas. Next, we'll need to know how far to move the object in each direction. I'll set this to just under half the height of the canvas. And finally, we'll need to know how fast to move the object back and forth. This will come down to how fast we're incrementing the angle so that it moves from 0 to 2 pi and beyond. We'll start with a value of 0 0.1 and also throw an angle variable in there as we'll need it. Now we can make a render function it will draw an object at a position calculated from all these variables. First we'll create a y variable. This will be equal to center y plus the sine of the angle times the offset. Remember that sine returns a value from minus 1 to plus 1. Multiply that times the offset and you get a value from minus offset to plus offset. That added to center y will have the value for y moving back and forth around center y. Next we just clear the canvas, begin a path, create a circle at positions center x and y, and fill it. We add speed to the angle variable to keep increasing it. And finally we call request animation frame, passing in the render function. This will result in render being called over and over at a rate that's synced with the screen refresh. This will definitely work in Google Chrome, but if you're using another browser, it may be named differently. On the off chance that you're using an older browser that doesn't support this at all, you may need to revert to set interval. I'll put a link in here to a useful function you can write that will ensure this works across just about every browser. Now we can test this and see that we do indeed have some vertical oscillating motion. Play with some of these values, particularly the speed and offset, to see how they change the animation. Of course, it doesn't just have to apply to position. We're just creating a series of values that are moving back and forth between minus 1 and 1. We can apply those numbers to any property. Let's try changing the size of the circle. Again, we'll need some kind of base value for the radius. It will get larger and smaller than that base value as the sine wave adds or subtracts from it. We'll call that base radius and set that to 100. We'll also change the offset to equal 50. This means the radius will go from 50, 100 minus 50, to 150, 100 plus 50. Now in the render function, we'll just change that so it creates a final radius and draws a circle center screen with that radius. Test that, and we'll see the circle growing and shrinking. What else can this be applied to? How about alpha? This time we'll need a base alpha, which will be 0.5, and an offset, also of 0.5. This will result in the final alpha ranging between 0.0 and 1.0. We'll change the render function to create an alpha value similar to the way we created the radius value. We'll have to construct an RGBA string, plugging that alpha value in and passing that to context.fillStyle. Now the circle fades in and out smoothly. As before, try different values to see how that changes the animation. Okay, that's all for this episode. I hope this was useful. In the next video, we'll take a look at using sine and cosine together to make circles, ellipses, and other far more interesting shapes and animations.